Well, good morning again. It's a great joy to be bringing God's Word to you. I'm going to do a little Simon Says here and have you guys stand back up as we have the reading of our Word, coming from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. So you find your way there. Just a reminder of where we are, beginning in chapter 12, Paul has that descriptive phrase to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then he proceeds to show all these things that make up our lives of spiritual worship. And unlike the rules that we were told of politics and religion never being discussed at the dinner table, nor from the pulpit, well, the politics at least, Paul shows us that's not true. And actually, how we approach the civil life has much to do, or the gospel has much to do with how we approach the civil life. So let's give our attention to the reading of God's word, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God and those that exist that have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. That sends God's word. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, you know how um, weak we are, or how fearful I am. Lord, you know the way passages like this can divide both a church and churches. Father, I pray that even as we walk through this passage that you would send your spirit, Lord, a spirit of unity as we are bound together in Christian love and faith, but also the spirit of Christian sobriety, that we, Lord, see things clearly and and with a new heart and mind. Father, allow us to be um, humble, eager recipients of your word. Be with me, Lord, a frail, broken, feeble tongue to accurately describe and portray your word as is given to us in Romans 13. Father, I pray in all things that we might see Christ, what a great friend of sinners he is indeed. Hallelujah to his name. So Lord, would you bind us together in love? Lord, in adoration of you, we pray this, this, after, this morning. Lord, change us, transform us into the very image of Christ. We ask this in his mighty and matchless name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, if you can't tell, I'm a little nervous about this. I've been, in many ways, must confess, dreading this for the last month and a half since I found out I would be preaching on this passage. And just to give a little listener beware before we begin, this is probably going to upset someone. Might upset a few people. Might upset everyone. There's some real tension in this season, and I'm not going to apologize for preaching what I believe God's word says, but I do want to say I want to welcome, if you have questions about what I said, if you have further questions about what this passage is talking about, please, I would love to talk more. Shoot me an email, come stop in my office, we'll grab lunch, a cup of coffee, something. Uh, I will say I'm not going to talk about it after the service. <laughs> uh, if you're interested in talking, say, let's grab lunch, and I'll, I'll follow up. And there's a, there's a certain challenge to preaching a text like this, because it's, it's very into both something that I'm not well-versed in, but it's, it's very into political theory. It's, it's, it's God's word suddenly taking root in how we view politics and, and civil life. Now, this isn't going to be a political lecture, but it's, it's an exposition of, of, of God's word. And so that means questions that you may have are not going to probably be answered. The many times I've taught, not the many times, a few times I've taught on this passage, all the questions I get are, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? Suffice it to say, probably none of those are going to be answered today. 
Right? This is a, 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 what we might call a universal principle being played out. And I just have to start off saying, I don't have all the answers. Surprise, surprise. And it's, in many ways, it's easy to nuance a topic like this to death where it really doesn't mean anything anymore. And it's also easy to, even as I stand here at this pulpit before you, to want to, you know, to keep everything on the surface level. And so you have a sermon without teeth. And my, my, my prayer is, even as I go on, and, and my humble request to you is that you listen. And I, in, respo- in response, promise to be as faithful and expositor as I can be. And as a faithful pastor as I can be to talk with anything you want to talk about. But again, I want to ask you to to listen to what I say and not assume what I say, if that makes sense. And in fact, in some ways, it's it's a danger to want to nuance them, to to, to learn as much about something, because you really stop having common sense about some issues. And in some ways, we might say this whole passage is just talking about common sense, enlightened common sense. G.K. Chesterton has a, a famous line where he says, the more a man looks at a thing, the less he can see it. And the man, more a man learns a thing, the less he knows it. And so in many ways, we're just, we are, it's God's people, we are called to receive and listen to God's simple, inspired, infallible word. Even where it hits us the hardest. Guess what, it's supposed to do that. See, God's word plants and it builds up, but guess what, it also knocks down. And it destroys. It tears apart, it rips asunder the idols that we have in our hearts. of How we think things should go. And if it's doing that, that's a good thing. That means the spirits at work in your heart and your life. Now, my father-in-law, he's a, uh, what's called a constitutional lawyer. I assume many of y'all know what that is. But he spent his career pretty much defending those, pretty, most of his clients have been those who have been arrested outside of abortion clinics, protesting abortion. And the state will come and arrest them and try and prosecute them based on some trumped up charge and he'll go and and defend them in court. In fact, he was defending the the court, if you're following some of the more recent trials, the the cases in Detroit and and Tennessee, he's tried cases in New York, all over the country, defending people's rights to really say, hey, maybe we shouldn't murder a child. And about two years ago, protesters were arrested in their homes almost a full year after an incident at an abortion clinic in Nashville, the one I just mentioned. You might remember this, one of the men named Paul Vaughn had his home stormed by FBI agents in full gear at eight o'clock in the morning as he was getting his kids ready for school for standing outside an abortion clinic begging people not to kill their children. While the past six months have been setting up their trials for their actions, particularly in in Tennessee, but there's also some trials in Michigan. And should they be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law based on this bizarre manipulation of federal right uh, legislation, they can spend up to 11 years in prison and face up to $250,000 in fines simply for standing outside an abortion clinic. Now, I start that off not to brag about my father-in-law, though he is very brag-worthy. I don't start it off to rile you up, get you mad at the government. I start it off to ask, really, or to maybe just to recognize the, the elephant in the room or the simple observation that many of us make, that we are living in a society that is growing increasingly hostile to Christian faith and virtue, Christian practice. But on the, on the heels of that, and, and even this passage speaks to this this morning, is how do we interact with the government, and even a government turning hostile to our faith? How do we interact with that? As I said earlier, Paul is not giving us a dummy's guide for political theology. He's not giving us a handout for you know, your constitutional rights. But he's establishing a, a principle for Christian interaction with authorities. A principle that must stand at the bottom of every Christian's approach to civic duty. And this morning we're gonna see sort of three parts to this principle. First, just the simple command, which we're gonna see is pretty simple. Then the rationale behind it, 
And then lastly, what that looks like, the application that Paul gives for his readers. So the command, the rationale, and the application. And the command, very simply, as he starts out in the very first verse, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Notice, first, it is very intentional, right? Paul is being as specific as possible. Normally when he's talking about men or mankind, he'll sometimes use the Greek word for man, anthropos, in sort of a generic man sense, mankind. But here he specifically says every person, or literally every soul, every soul. So there's, there's no one who's exempt from this command. If you know your medieval theology, you know the popes and some of the bishops and the priests were like, hey, I don't have to do this. I'm a priest, I'm a member of the kingdom of God, not the, not the state. Pope even went so far as to say, no, 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 I tell the king what to do, not the king telling me what to do. And here, Paul very simply, no, no one is exempt from this. But then second, notice too, there is no qualification. He doesn't say, submit yourself to good authority. He doesn't say, submit yourself to bad authority. So submit yourselves to the governing authorities. He doesn't even say submit yourselves to democratically elected authorities. But to submit yourselves to the authorities. And part of the reason, you know, th- this, this would have been not really a shock, but a necessary teaching as it is today for us, but even for then, think, remember his audience, a mix of Jews and, and Gentiles, and Jews at this time, you know, middle of the first century AD, had a history of rebellion and revolt against the Roman Empire. Right, so all the way back in the kind of the beginning of the second century BC, there were this group of Jews called the Maccabees, who were just tired of Roman rule and kind of had this whole revolt. Uh, and really, it was kind of the Maccabees that began what was Antiochus Epiphanes. Epip, ep, you get it? You can't say it. You look it up and tell me how it's, how it's said. Came in and, and offered that, what's called the abom- an abomination of desolation. There are new, even in the scriptures we see in the gospel accounts, these numerous accounts of people kind of rising up against the Roman rule. We think of Barabbas, right? The robber who killed some people in a revolt. We, or even the other, an account of Jesus where, or, where the high priest says, remember this guy who tried to stir up a rebellion and he was squashed in like moments Let's not worry about Jesus. Same thing's going to happen. And so as with these Jews and their history of revolt, Paul is trying to remind them of, hey, we're not trying to reclaim the, the, the nation state of Israel, the kingdom of David in our Christianity. And even throughout history, right, there have been Christians who want to take freedom, even as Paul says in Galatians 5, the freedom that we have in the gospel to mean Absolutely no worldly authority whatsoever. All right, so the big group in here was the Anabaptists in the 1500s, and then break off groups in the Amish and the Mennonites, right, who believe that there is no you know, dealings with the world. They don't have to submit to governing authorities because they're not part of the world. But there's also a separate threat to this passage, and we've seen it before. In fact, our own heritage, unfortunately, has a, pa- has a history of interpreting it this way, where we just become totally quietistic in what we do. Oh, no, 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 I can't talk about that. That's politics. It's not for me. I submit. Right? And, and, and many, to the, to the shame of our denomination, many in our heritage in the Southern Presbyterian Church did just that when it came to slavery. No, 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 I can't preach against it. That's politics. And many today do the same with abortion. No, 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 I can't preach against abortion. That's politics. So these two dangers that Paul is trying to balance out, right? It's not full-on rebellion, and it's not full-on just ultra-submission. But it is submission, being subject to someone and, and something. Then it's that word that probably sticks in your craw a little bit, doesn't it? Be subject Submit. No one likes it. Let's just be honest. I don't like it when people tell me what to do. You don't like it when people tell you what to do. 
And John Murray, systematic theologian, he says that this word submit has far more implications than just simple obedience. Sure, it means obedience, but it also indicates the recognition of our subordination in the whole realm of the magistrate's jurisdiction and willing subservience to their authority. Let me say that again, right? Recognizing that we are subject means that we recognize our subordination in the whole realm of the magistrate's jurisdiction in the civil realm and willing subservience to their authority. Right, so very simply, submission, subjection, means you recognize you are not the top dog. And again, you probably know the debates, or some of the debates of church history, that this in itself causes a lot of hubbub. Right, third wave feminism pushes back hard. You telling me a woman has to submit to her husband? Or even membership, right? The questions, that the, we have a lot of, you've seen them time and again, the five questions for membership, but the one we spend the most time on with people is that fifth question where you promise and vow to submit to the oversight of the session and their discipline and government. And we have to break it down for them so that they see exactly what they're stepping into. And, and maybe some of you out there today, that's what's kept you from membership because you don't want to submit. Well, here Paul is telling us our entire lives are one of submission, even in the civic sphere. Now, let me just, again, caveat that with saying, Paul is not saying you then have to obey any and everything that they say, okay? Submission does not mean blatant acceptance of all that happens to you. But it is, as I said, the principle which everyone, every Christian must start with as it begins thinking about civic duty. It begins with Submission, recognizing that they're in charge and you're not. They have authority and you do not. And we see this same command repeated by Peter in his first epistle, Peter 2, 13 through 17, where he says, be subject for the Lord's sake. Hear this, almost in more stronger language, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme Remember, the emperor was not a good guy at this time. Or the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Christian civic duty begins with recognizing our place. Our principle is the starting point that as creatures of God, as his servants, we are placed in a time and regional locale in which he has ordered things. He has placed government in charge. He has placed families. He has placed police in various structures of authority in certain times and places. And we have to recognize that as we step into civic duty. Now there may be times for far more serious forms of resistance. I'm not, again, Paul is not saying never do this, and I'm not saying never do this. But if armed resistance is your first response, Maybe crank it down a little bit. Skip the cup of coffee in the morning. And we'll see this again. The Christian faith demands that you recognize you are not in charge of where you place yourself. God places you in certain communities, in certain times, in certain places. And that's the command. As hard as it is to hear, that's, that's the command. Be subject to the governing authorities. But then it gives rationale. He wants to show us why exactly we are to be subject. Again, as I said, the Bible, the Christian faith, demands a whole new viewpoint right, to see the world. And here Paul is trying to get to show us what's behind the veil. And the, very, the first reason he gives is that all authority, notice what he says, there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Very simply, if someone's in power, they did not get there on accident. God placed them there. And this is all over the Old Testament. All over Scripture, there is verse after verse after verse of God placing people 
in power. We think of Joseph, whose steps to power began with being sold into slavery. What does he say? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Proverbs 8.15, Isaiah 45.1, Daniel 2.21, all of these passages talking about leaders that have been set in place by God. And here's the kicker to this. That doesn't change in 2024. If someone gets elected, whether or not there was funny business in the 2020 election, God placed them there. God has placed every president, every senator, every congressperson, every governor, mayor, anyone you could possibly imagine in any sort of authority in the United States, God has placed them there. That's the very first, first reason. And there's, we kind of miss it because you know, English and Greek are, are two different languages. But there's a word that Paul uses throughout these first two verses. A word in different forms, but conveying different, the similar ideas in different contexts. And it's the Greek word tasso, which means to order things. You know, it can mean to, uh, like you put blocks in order, or you even order a list of stuff. Uh, it, it means you put things in its proper place. And Paul uses this word four different ways in this, these two different, in these two passages. First we see we are to be subject or subordered, it's the word hupotasso, under the government. So we're to be under, ordered under the government. And that's because God, uh, he says, for there is no authority except from God the, and those that have been instituted by God, those that have been tassoed by God, because God places them there. But then in verse two, therefore whoever resists the authority, that's the word antitasso, so you, you, you defy the order. You actually are resisting what God has appointed, what God has diotasso. This, this one word, tasso, is kind of filtering through this whole passage to show us we're to be properly ordered because God properly orders things. God orders all things. And notice, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Often, it may mean if you resist the authorities that God has set in place, you're not just resisting a governor you don't like or a mayor who's a little shady, but you're resisting God. Again, Paul is not, this is a, this is a principle that does not necessarily apply to every situation. But it does apply to some of the most surprising situations. Right? I mentioned uh, Daniel, I mentioned uh, Isaiah, of uh, this passage of where God has placed these, power, these rulers in power. And both of those, the, pa- but the, the thing that both those passages have in common is neither of those kings in power are very good people. Right? Cyrus, sure, he, he was the one that sent Jude- Judeans back to Judah to establish the cities. But guess what? He was a pretty terrible dictator, tyrant, emperor. Killed a lot of people. And then and Nebuchadnezzar, not known to be the most friendly guy. And in fact, we even see this in Jeremiah 27, verses 6 through 8. God says, Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the beasts of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him, and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. But if any nation or king will not serve this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine and with pestilence, declares the Lord, until I have consumed it by his hand. Pretty powerful words. If anyone kind of fit the description of an emperor to be resisted, Certainly, it was, it was Nebuchadnezzar, right? If I was being invaded, sure, I would probably be afraid and because I'm a coward, but right, he'd be the guy to resist, knowing you know, whether I die or not, I'm not going to serve Nebuchadnezzar. And here's God saying, if you do that, I'm going to punish you because you're disobeying me and not submitting to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. 
kind of hits us in the teeth a little bit, doesn't it? Second reason, they're appointed, they're, first reason, they're appointed by God. Second reason, the rulers and authorities are servants of God. And notice how it says, it's their servants for your good and also servants of God for wrath. Or as it says in the ESV, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And the second reason, right, God places them there, and the second reason, he places them there for a purpose. A purpose. He places them there very simply to keep the peace. They are the ones that God has sovereignly ordained to mete out judgment, and as it says in 2 Peter 2, to praise those who do good. And this is where we kind of push back against the Mennonite, the, the Anabaptistic, who want to throw off any you know, forms of government because we need to recognize we live in a fallen world. Sinful people do sinful things. And we need boundaries for protection, for justice to be meted out to those who commit crimes. And this is, you know, as people have said, the total depravity is perhaps the one empirically proven tenant of Calvinism. You can see brokenness all over the place. You can see evil all over the place. Well, it doesn't take long to look around the world and see someone has to maintain order, right? Think of first the, whatever that town in Portland, you know, the, the indep- independent zone of whatever that broke out in 2020, where everyone was equal, no one, had to, no one was, was accountable to anyone, and guess what? Crime was crazy, they ran out of food, people were, you know, starving to death, there was probably dysentery going on, I mean, it was just... You want a full anarchist society, that's what happens. Or even, perhaps just a kind of a hilarious turn of events, in June 2020, a certain Detroit politician tweeted out this. She said, we are going to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Say it with me. Dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Pretty strong. And then in 2023, after she got carjacked and pistol whipped, she tweeted out, thank you to the incredible Minneapolis 4th Precinct officers, Mayor Mayor Frey, Chief O'Hara, paramedics, neighbors, friends, and DFL family who all came to our aid during this terrifying experience. I'm so grateful for this community that wraps us in love. It's easy to say, government's awful, boo government. And then someone pistol whips you and you think someone's got to keep the peace. And that's what God has placed them there for, to do just that. Notice he says that the ruler does not bear the sword in vain. He does not bear the sword in vain. It's the state that has the right for capital punishment for crimes. Unlike the church, The church exhorts people with rebuke the word of God, but it's the state that is able to wield the sword in punishment for crimes. It wields the sword in defense from invaders to defend its inhabitants. And it also, in certain conditions, must take up the sword in offense. Must take up the sword. That opens up a whole new can of worms that we're not gonna talk about. We can talk about it later. But notice, as Paul spends a lot of time developing this idea, or focusing on this idea, the reason they're there is for good, for your good, and for being an avenger of God's wrath. And he even says, hey, if you're afraid of the government, make sure, first and foremost, it's not because you're doing shady stuff. Right? Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, I'm going to have this kind of confession time. When I was uh, 13, 14, 15, all those ages, uh, there's this awesome new program called LimeWire that just came out. Some of you may are like, what is LimeWire? Some sort of drink or something? Um, But it was a a program that allowed you to obtain music and TV shows in in less than legal means, let me say. And me being the dumb, sinful teenager that I was, just ran rampant with it, right? And the whole time, I was like, yeah, this is great, but then, letters from Homeland Security started coming out. 
And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's intense. And yours truly was the lucky recipient of one, one such letter. But even as, a, right, you can say you, you know, why are you resisting the government? Why do you fear their power? And Paul wants to make sure that it's not because we are committing sins that are worthy of punishment in our quest for Christian freedom. Now, there's a question that's been asked to me. What about a government that has shown that it doesn't want to protect good things? I'm glad you asked. I don't have an answer for you. (laughs) But again, it's this baseline principle of recognizing the purpose for civil authorities and to, to submit ourselves to their protection and to their governance of what is right. And lastly, so the first is that they are placed by God. Second, they are servants, and it's that word, I forgot to say this, that word diakonos, servants of God. And then lastly, Paul says, they are ministers of God. And just pause for a second, the the power of those two words, diakonos, servant, and then minister, liturgos. We, we, we find those words used elsewhere, but Leturgos, particularly, Paul will refer to himself in Romans 15, 16 as a minister, a Leturgos of God. And Paul isn't saying one-to-one, you know, I am the, I'm a civic authority, they're a, an ecclesial authority, it's not what he's saying, but he is trying to make the connection that just as you know, apostles, prophets, teachers, elders, are the appointed means of governance in the church that God, Christ has given his church. So also, governing authorities are, the, like I said, the means, the, the officers who are in charge of the civil sphere. They are the ones who God uses to work his mighty arm in salvation, to, 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 to have his glory and kingdom come into the earth, but in the civic sphere. And again, here's something we must never forget, that if we're truly going to stand with the sovereignty of God and how he saves us and rescues us from our fallenness and corruption and brokenness, he has no less control of what's going on over this world right now. God didn't somehow gloss over government when he was making his plan of salvation. But he's using even broken, sometimes wicked, governments to make his purposes known. Here's just a a brief aside, thinking about this, especially with that phrase, servants of good, or servants for your good, and avengers for those who practice evil. Just very briefly, we also need to remember, even as we think about this, good and evil are not neutral, abstract words. We don't just passively receive whatever the culture tells us is good and evil, and think, yeah, great, let's just go with that. Both good and evil require religious answers. The minute you tell me what is good and what is bad, you're making a religious assumption. You're saying something about the way you view the world, something about the God that you worship, when you say something is good or evil. And you, Christians, in a Democratic Republic must be guided by what God says is good and evil. Perhaps the greatest lie the the devil ever fooled this country with, as I said, it even goes into our own religious tradition. But the greatest lie is that you could have your civic values and your religious values, and there the twain shall meet. You You can believe that life begins at conception, that's well and fine. But just, just don't tell a woman what to do with her body. Let me say, first and foremost, that is a religious answer to a moral question. It's not political. And here's the religion, just, just as, to use that example, here's, our, here's the religion behind that answer. This comes from the Supreme Court decision, decision Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1991. And if you may remember, this was 20 years after Roe v. Wade, but this was the decision that basically said, hey, states can't outlaw abortion. It's a federal right. And here's what the author of this Supreme Court decision said. 
At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Let me, just, let me just read that one more time. At the heart of liberty, again, connecting it all the way back to the Declaration of Independence, is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Now, they may not say this explicitly, but here's what that's saying implicitly. You have the right to define life in whoever and however you want it, especially if it's a child growing in your womb. That's the religion upholding that answer. Pure, 100% humanism. You are the center of the world, and guess what? You get to say anything about everything. Now, just so that the obvious is not lost on us, excuse me, that argument was the same argument made with slavery 150 years prior. I have the right to say this African is not a person. I have the right to say this fetus, you're really just saying small child in Latin, is not a human life. Or even, a, I'm not going to use names, but a very big person in, in government recently said, it's important to note that to support a woman's ability, a, a woman's ability not her government, but her, to make that decision to have an abortion does not require anyone to abandon their faith or their beliefs. And you'll get a lot of different answers, but that's not true. You do have to abandon religious beliefs to say that this is not a person and this is. You do have to abandon religious beliefs to say this 13-year-old can just go through gender therapy. It's totally fine. Our, our values, our, what is good and evil, has to come from Scripture. Can't be dictated by what the culture tells us. Or perhaps even just a, another one. Right, you, can, you can personally believe that marriage is between one man and one woman, but, but, but civically, we have to say it's open for all. No, actually, it's not. Again, words mean things. Marriage means something. We can't just let that wash away with everything else. All of these answers, and many quote unquote political answers are defined by the religious impulse that you hold in your heart. They require some sort of religious belief to back up what you're saying. Now, let me just say, it is not wrong to want to see biblical conceptions of good and evil to prevail in society. And a lot of people are sort of scolding Christians for wanting you know, marriage to be upheld, life to be regarded all the way to conception. But it's not wrong to want that. We should push and work and labor that biblical conceptions of good and evil of justice come forth in society. But let me tell you this, too. It's not through violence. It's not through forcing, make sure, twist, strong-arming people to make us agree with them. Right? And in fact, someone in this room went to seminary with the man who went, stopped at an abortion clinic, shot him and his bodyguard and his nurse. That's not the way we impose biblical conceptions of good and evil but there is, if I can have a, a slightly political statement for a moment, if you will grant me that, as citizens of America, we have a way to do that. And that's in your vote. What you, the, the, the name you select, whenever you go to the voting, poll, the voting booths, 
And let me just say, too, whenever you vote, you are casting a vision for something. Now, there's probably a lot of reasons to not vote for either candidate. (laughs) Believe me, I know. But if you're only voting because you don't want something, ask yourself, what are you actually voting for? What are you actually voting for? Is it a biblical conception of good and evil? All right, that's over. Now let's briefly look at the application. Paul gives us the command, be subject. He gives us the rationale. They're placed by God. They're placed by God for our good and our protection. And lastly, they're ministers. They're the, the ordered servants for that realm. And then he turns in verse seven, verse six and seven, to what that looks like. And again, notice, this is very brief. He doesn't lay out everything that's expected. But notice, he says, for because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers to God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. All these things, taxes, revenue, which is sort of a a separate offering, civic offering, honor, respect, those are due to these people and people in authority because, not because of who they are, but because of the office that they hold. Right? Again, there's probably a good reason to rail against the tax rate, certain tax rates in our country, but you can't just say boo taxes. Because guess what? Right here, we're commanded to pay taxes to support the civic authorities and their work of upholding good and evil. Or honor, right? Respect. And here's where things get a little bit more convicting for me. Every leader, whether they are the worst leader or the best leader, is worthy and do your respect. <laughs> do, they are do my respect. Right? Just think about it. Again, Nebuchadnezzar makes this grand proclamation. Anyone who worships anything except for me, whenever they hear the horns and the blastings, gets thrown into the fire. These three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they don't do it. And there's, a, there's an example of disobedience. But when they get arrested and brought before Nebuchadnezzar, you don't read them saying, you're the worst, Nebuchadnezzar. You're not even a real king. God's my king. I'm not doing what you say. No, they say, whatever you say, we're not going to do it. And even if God doesn't rescue us, guess what? We're still not going to do it. Or Daniel. Or even Paul. Right? You don't have to turn there, but in Acts 23... Three through five, again, this is, and this is a little bit of a sort of combining categories here, but it works nonetheless. 23, three through five, Paul is arrested. He's brought before the tribunal of Israel, of Judah, and uh, he's, taught, he's uh, speaking, and the high priest, is beginning verse two, the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall, Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? And those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? I don't know, Paul doesn't, he's not about to say, or maybe we would expect to say, yeah, because he's not the high priest anyways. Jesus is my high priest, I can talk to him however I want. But no, and Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Even Paul, right? kind of in the procession that would lead to his death, recognizes respect to whom respect is owed. Very simply, right, taxes, things like taxes, things like honor. That's part of what it means to be a citizen in time and place. I'm gonna skip over a couple things, but now for the question that probably everyone is dying to know because this is always the question that I get. Where do we have to obey? 
what do I have to obey what the government says? And just even as I examine my own heart and how often I want to ask, but where's the line? What do I have to do? I was convicted thinking, is that really the right way to phrase the question? It seems like going off of what Paul says in Romans 13 and even in 1 Timothy 2, 1 Peter 2, these various passages, the question is not where do we have to obey, but perhaps a far more sobering, obey in everything you can, and where must you disobey? See how that sort of flips it? Thinking where do I obey is sort of like how far can I get? Right? Or if you're married, what exactly do you define as adultery? And this is, this question, what is the absolute limit where God says, I can't go any further? I'll go up to this point, but I can't go any further. Notice one is placed by you, one is placed by God. And very briefly, very quickly, There's sort of three ways we can think about government ruling that I think even Paul has in here and is a strong part of Presbyterian and Reformed political theology. There are those things written in law that are also written in Scripture, or might say also in accord with biblical wisdom. And those things you have to do. There's no question about it. We talked about taxes, or even, to the chagrin of those who wake up late every morning, traffic laws. They, there is nothing, con- there's actually good biblical wisdom to have traffic laws, to protect lives, to have order on the streets. But then there are, if there are those things written in law and in, in accord with biblical wisdom or in accord with scripture itself, there are also those things written in law and against scripture. We see these things in Daniel, worship, being, being forced to worship another king, or in the early church, just sprinkle a little salt to Caesar. We might think back to four years ago, right, where prob- it was good, probably good common sense to just, you know, when COVID broke out, to take a step back, close things down, and just see what happened. But as evidence continued to come out of the government not really knowing what to do, churches had the right to say, no, we must open. We must bring God's people back to worship, whether you find us or not, whether you arrest us or not, and many were arrested. Or you might think of, even if you were here last week for our missions conference, Chris Brock mentioning the fact that even talking about abortion from a pulpit means you might get shut down by the government in France there. And yet him being bound to the word of God, he must preach against that when it comes up. And all of this is based on Acts 5.29, where Peter and uh, James, I believe, are preaching, teaching in in the synagogues and they arrest them, they beat them, and they say, hey, you're free to go, but just don't do it again. And then as soon as they get out, they come right back to the synagogue and start teaching and preaching. They say, hey, what did we just say? Don't do it. Peter says, we must obey God rather than man. We must obey what God has commanded. But then thirdly, so there are things written in law and in accord with Scripture that you must obey. There are things written in law and against Scripture that you must disobey. There's also those things written in law and not expressly in Scripture, nor explicitly against Scripture, that just require wisdom. Right? They requ- re- require wisdom to know when it is okay to disobey these things. And, you know, we could, there are different ways we could frame this, but just for example, right, if Grace as a minister, as a registered church, as a 501c3, and uh, we are technically um, uh, not, we are tax exempt, so we don't pay taxes on quote unquote profit that we make, we don't make profit. Um, but if the government came to us and said, hey, to keep your 501c3 status, to um, you know, make sure you're staying tax exempt, you've gotta hire, you know, at least have one non-believer on your non-ministry staff, like your janitor has to be not related to your church or something, like, right? Some sort of uh, thing to that. Well, it, it, depending on the context, it may not be wise 
to say yes, but it may not be unwise to say yes. Right? Context demands wisdom there. But here's the hard part about this category, is that just because you think it is wrong does not mean that it is wrong in and of itself. And even going back to what Paul says, you know, to oppose something in this category, you may actually be opposing God himself. And I guess what I'm trying to say is in that last category where wisdom is required, recognize that you are not the arbiter of truth and justice. You, just like me, might get something wrong. Again, I'm not going to talk about any of this after service, but you can email me. <laughs> and even in all of these things, obedience, and Paul is no stranger to this. In those times when we disobey, right, it is necessary that we understand and expect the consequences. We understand that disobeying authorities for the word of God, right, doing what obeying God rather than man is going to bring consequences. And really all of 1 Peter is about this in, in, in some form or another. Right? As, we, again, as we kind of wind this down, we think about really living in a culture that is, again, ratcheting its hostility up against Christianity. All of us may have to take a stand that costs us something. That costs us some sort of punishment. And, and I think about this passage from 1 Peter 2 as, it, when this, as I was thinking through this, this part where he says, this is a grace, gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, it, if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So obeying God rather than man and suffering for it is a glorious thing, a gracious thing in the sight of God. It was a glorious thing when Nebuchadnezzar threw those three friends into the fiery furnace. God's name was glorified far more than we could ever imagine. And when we're approaching the question of obedience and disobedience, suffering and not, it requires us in some respects to lay down our question of rights. We're good red-blooded Americans. We all know what we have the right to do, what the government can't touch us for. And yet we have to recognize one day they, that may disappear. And the gospel actually requires us to, to lay down our rights and suffer for doing good. Even if the governing authorities are, are evil and wicked and breaking all sorts of just laws in doing it, we suffer willingly, obediently, knowing that God is honored. Now, if I haven't talked vague enough for you for 35 minutes... Paul is once again, just to stress this, laying down a principle here of submission to governing authorities, a principle that demands prayer, reflection, and wisdom on how to apply it in any given situation. So before I close, let me just say, Reformed tradition, the Christian tradition, has literally thousands of years of thinking on this question. So let me encourage you, if you have questions, go read. Ask me for recommendations. If you've got opinions but you've never read, go read. We are not an island standing here siloed from the rest of church history, but we have good models and men to read from all throughout church history. But at the end of all this, as we think about submission to government, as we think about being civil servants, as we think about even being civil servants in a country that may turn on us, we have to ask ourselves this. Do we trust the God behind our government? Wherever we are, whether it's here in America, you know, buttressed by the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, or it's in North Korea, that it's just if you happen to be the son of Kim Jong-un, you're in power. Do you trust the God who puts those 
places, those, those, those governments in power. Do you, as you think about all the ways that this country could go, do you really trust the Lord in using his servants, his ministers, the ones he set in place for his ultimate glory? Do you really trust that? Or do you think, man, God needs some help in picking the next president? Because here, in, in, in all passages of Scripture, this is where the question points us. Who do you trust? Where does your heart lie? I mentioned those Christians earlier arrested for uh, protesting abortion. And just about a month and a half ago, less than a month and a half ago, back in August, many of them, my father-in-law there representing them, many of them were found guilty of this crime, preventing clinical access. And, and like I said, many of them face 11 years in prison, $250,000 in fines. And I know, as I, as I think about that, I know that if I was in that courtroom, if I was the one on the dock, whew, I would be furious. How dare they do this? This is unjust. And it may be right to have a little righteous indignation. Hold a press conference for why this is so evil. Maybe even start planning my prison escape. Because it just isn't right for me to suffer like this. Well, here's what happened. As a newspaper article talked about this story, one of the men sentenced was a man named Cal Zastro from up in Michigan. This reporter writes that immediately after the verdict was handed down, this man, Cal Zastro, said, isn't Jesus good? Let's go outside and sing. Isn't Jesus good? Whether we live in an a nation hunting down Christians, or we live in a nation that upholds all Christian values. Isn't Jesus good? So we submit, not because this, this or that president is worthy of our submission, but because Jesus commands it. We suffer under evil rulers knowing that we have Jesus. The way your heart riles up when CNN or, or Fox News, whatever your drug of choice is, that may be just a little bit of the Holy Spirit saying, who do you actually worship? Who do you actually worship? Is Jesus good for you? Is he really good? Again, I would love to talk with you more, and I'm hoping you send me an email. Don't harbor resentment. Don't think, I'm, I'm sure someone will think I'm a total quietist here, and some person will think I'm just a, you know, a total moral majority preacher. Come and talk to me, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. And we thank you that even in hard passages, Lord, your spirit works. Lord, even a passage like this reminded myself of where the power of the word comes from. It's not from my own speaking ability or study ability, but it is solely from you. Father, would you show us where we have in rebellion against the order that you have set before us have actually rebelled against you? Or would you reveal to us where we are to take a stand and disobey, knowing that we must, Lord, bend the knee ultimately to you. Father, be with your saints this morning. Be with them as they go home. Father, we pray for those in Asheville and Augusta and Tennessee and Greenville, all over this southeast, who are, are suffering unimaginable loss some even the loss of their lives. And Lord, we know that we can have this sermon, we can think about political theology precisely because we're not going through those things. Would you remind us of your great blessings to us? We pray that you would protect those still in danger, pray for the search crews, the rescue parties, 
Lord, we, just, we pray that your mercy would go forth. And even as relief teams get ready, and some even on the way, uh, that you would, by your great power, use this to bring many to faith. Lord, as Christians gather around to, to serve those broken, needing some sort of good news, Father, would this in your great and marvelous mercy be the very means by which they hear for the very first time about this God who sent his son named Jesus for us. Father, we ask this in his mighty and matchless name. Amen. Well, would you now please stand for the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.